So hello, welcome MVLA parents and students. You are logging into the session, how do college admissions officers evaluate applications? It might not be what you think by Reed College. If you are not in the right session, please return to the countdown website for the right link. Today, Gabri Lafrada is joining us from the Reed's Reed Admissions Office. Gabri is an Assistant Dean of Admissions. Gabri, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, it is nice to be chatting with you all. Um, like, like Linda said, I'm an admission counselor at Reed. I am the regional admission counselor for Mountain View and Los Altos schools. Um, I oversee most of Northern California, Oregon, and Hawaii as well. Um, and I've been mission counselor for two years, so I've read many, many applications. Um, to give you guys just an overview of what we're going to be chatting about today, um, we're going to do essentially a case study of an application. So we're going to look at a college profile. It is of a made-up university, Jefferson University, um, and this college profile provides a really great overview of things that this college is sharing about them, um, including their values, maybe um, average GPA, SAT scores, all of that. And so it's kind of the best way to get as best of a window into a college admission process and what they're looking at. Um, and then we're going to pull up a fake application and essentially just walk our way through this application um, and come to a decision about if we would admit the student to Jefferson University. Um, I'll then leave it plenty of time for questions so you guys can ask as many questions about the admission process or just Reed's own application evaluation process. Happy to answer those. Um, but yeah, let me pull up this college profile. Here, awesome. Is everyone able to see that? It looks like it. Um, okay, so this is the college profile of Jefferson University. Once again, a made up university. Um, a, I think helpful tip is that every single college should have a college profile. So if you were to look up Reed College college profile, it would be the first thing that would pop up. I have it right here. This is what our college profile looks like. So any college that your student might be considering, I think it's really helpful to, you know, take a look at that college's profile because it has really helpful statistics about, you know, the size of the school, GPA, things like that. Um, and so once again, we're back at Jefferson University. Um, and so we're just going to kind of walk our way through this profile and discuss um, things that are mentioned and what that might mean in terms of what they're looking for in an applicant. Um, I'll also add that, you know, the profile, the college profile is never going to tell you every single thing that a college is looking for in an application. Um, and, you know, please do not spend time trying to figure out every single thing that any given college is looking for, because I feel like you'll just, you know, drive yourself a little silly, um, because there are some things that colleges advertise and there's something that's just kind of behind the scenes. Um, so I always like to mention that to especially to students to make sure that they, you know, they don't stress themselves out while looking at a college profile too much. Um, just an important thing to consider. So starting off at this top right here, we see that Jefferson University has been around for a while, founded in 1856. Um, we see, let me pull up the little highlight actually. Right. Okay, here we go. We see that it is a selective private university located just 30 minutes from a major major urban center. Um, so this is really helpful just so you know location. Um, and it has just under a million residents in that urban location. Um, so, you know, schools are going to be in a wide variety of areas, some are more rural, some are going to be closer to cities, so that's just helpful when determining, you know, what type of college environment you want the surrounding area to be. Um, Jefferson has a strong sense of history, but a forward-looking philosophy with regards to education, um, and so a strong liberal arts core. Um, that means that they're going to be really allowing students to take lots of different classes and lots of different departments and probably really encouraging, you know, interdisciplinary thinking, um, combining different topics, all of that. Um, and you also note that they say they have excellent pre-professional opportunities, 
So business, engineering, performing arts, and nursing. Um, so that means they're definitely going to be looking for students who will be taking into account those pre-professional opportunities. Oh, yeah, I got a question about can I zoom in? We can definitely do that. Okay, here we go. Oh, a little too much zoom. There we go. Um, okay. Let me erase these lines. Okay, so we see now that they are also focused on recruiting the best and the brightest. So they have a highly sought off honors program. Um, okay, and so these are just, you know, a nice overview of programs that the school is offering and things that, you know, they are probably putting a lot of money and resources into. Um, Next, you see that's the president, who is a former ambassador for the U.S., is pushing for increasing global awareness um, and action on part of the faculty and students. Um, so you might see that maybe they're looking for students who are really involved in their local communities or are active. Are active. Um, so these could just be kind of values that they might be looking for in other students. Um, you'll also note that a highly successful capital campaign has resulted in a brand new student athletic facility. Um, so they're definitely going to be wanting students who are involved in, you know, sports to be able to use that nice brand new facility. Um, and they've also got some new dorms and a new museum of art on campus. So they've got a lot going on. Um, now, once you've kind of gone past the like overview of just generally what this college has on offer you get into more of the specifics um, so there's a total of 7,000 so it's a pretty small school 5,000 are undergraduates um, and then the College of Arts and Sciences is the largest of the five colleges and then you also see business engineering performing arts nursing um, so like I said these are probably you know some of the departments that are receiving most of their funding um, and they want to be able to highlight that and know that these are options for you know current or potential students um, we're going to keep on scrolling down um, and see this paragraph right here is really just more further information about programs that they have on offer and important um, popular majors. We're going to keep on going down to the bottom. So let's see, you'll see that currently 95% of undergraduate students live on campus. Um, so this is more just about the atmosphere of the school. Clearly, it's a very residential school. And um, that's definitely something, you know, when you're looking into the co colleges your students are going to be applying to, you know, do they um, guarantee freshman and sophomore housing? What does that process look like? So just an important thing to look at at the college profile. Um, okay, you'll see they do have sororities and fraternities. Um, so another thing to be aware of when you're, you know, going through the college search, search process and what your student is looking for is Greek life something they're interested in is Greek life something that they don't want to be a part of um, and would prefer to not exist at a school. So just, you know, more things to consider. And now when you get to the bottom of the college profile is where you get more of the numbers. And so you see where students land in their high school and you know kind of what attracts them to Jefferson essentially or I guess the type of students they're looking for to bring to Jefferson. So out of all the students that are coming to Jefferson you see they have an average GPA of 3.6. Um, Jefferson does accept to test scores that is another thing you definitely want to be aware of um, especially with the colleges changing being you know requiring test scores some are test blind some are test optional definitely something to be aware of and average test scores that a college sees their students having um so right now we got a middle 50 percent um of 610 to 710 that's the english one and then the math of 650 to 740 um and then you see the rank in class um, and so this is where a student's high school ranking was. Um, and so you're seeing that Jefferson top quintile, 35% of the students that come to Jefferson are in that top quintile of their high school class. Um, and you'll see that a large portion of their students are in that, 
you know, at least top third of their high school class. So the students that are Jefferson's bringing in are definitely pretty, um, they're doing well in school, they're most likely taking rigorous classes, they're doing well on the SAT, doing well on the ACT as well, with that 28 to 32 score. Um, so you can really kind of gather that this is going to be a fairly selective and competitive college. Um, you'll also see right here this line at the top of that last paragraph, admission to Jefferson is selected with approximately 33% of overall applicants admitted. So definitely a selective college. Um, and so these are going to be, you know, average numbers of what they're seeing for students who are applying and for the students that they are accepting. Um, this can be a really great way to for prospective students to tell if the school is a reach school, um, if a school is, you know, going to be a most likely admit for them. Um, and I definitely recommend, you know, taking a look at all of the colleges that your student is applying to and the numbers and kind of averages. That way you're able to, um, your student is able to apply to, you know, a wide variety of colleges, have some reach schools in there, but also have some safety schools out as well. Um, and you'll be able to determine, you know, what's a reach school versus what's a safety school through that college profile. Okay, so now that we've really um, gotten through the college profile of Jefferson University um, and have an idea of kind of what they're looking for, we're going to take a look at a fake application of someone who applied to Jefferson University. Um, Okay, and that's what we got right here. Um, before we kind of dive into this application, I do want to say, um, so while all of the information on this fake application is going to match up with what the common application looks like now, um, there's been some like slight stylistic changes. So if you're thinking in the back of your head, this doesn't quite look like what I'm seeing when my student, you know, logs into the common application. That's the only reason they just have a slight like stylistic change, but otherwise all the still same information. Um, and so this is really what I see as an admission counselor. All of this information that we're going to run through are things that are sent to me by either the students, the students high school college counselor or any recommenders. Um, additionally, I will see if that student has, you know, emailed read or if they've, you know, contacted me in the past. So that's just a bit of a heads up of what we're seeing when we're reading an application. Um, and the first page of the common application really provides this broad overview of a student. So very, very like distant view of the student. And we'll see that the application we're looking at is Kevin Matthews. Let me zoom in here so you guys are all able to see that. Um, so Kevin Matthews, preferred name Kev. Um, male student born in March of 1999. You'll see he provides his contact information and permanent address. There's also a brief demographic overview. He says that he um, is Christian, no military status, um, not Latinx. Um, and he does share that he is mixed race, so he's mixed with Asian and white. Um, you know, you students are also prompted to list which languages they speak at home. Um, this is a really helpful information. That way we're able to know if, you know, English is a student's first language or if, you know, English is not spoken in the home. And um, so Kev does speak English or uh, like spoken in the home. Uh, it's his first language. And he also speaks up um, French. Um, I'm going to assume since it's not, you know, noted as spoken at home, probably French classes. Um, sometimes you'll see students list the language classes that they take as the language that they speak, which I think is really great. Um, U.S. citizen, and then you'll see no fee, fee waiver requested for the common application. Um, many colleges do have application fees. I'll quickly say Reed does not have an application fee, it is free to apply. Um, but there is no fee waiver here. The next thing after we get those kind of broad demographic information about the applicant is you see family information. So you see that Kev's parents are, let's see, married, both parents are alive. Um, looks like parent one is a physician and parent two is a dentist. 
Um, and so they're both very, very um, educated. And so this is really helpful, especially because a lot of colleges take into account if a student is a first generation student. Um, and so Kev is not a first generation student. And so his parents who have gone to many different schools and have a lot of schooling are probably telling him like, hey, reach out to that college or go visit that college. Um, whereas if it was a first generation student applying, they might not have a person in their home saying, hey, you should go interview with the school or you should go visit. And um, so that is something we pay attention to as well. Um, and it also additionally, Kev has an older brother who is currently in college. Um, so, so that's also helpful information. It sounds like they've already sent one kid to school and so they're probably already fairly familiar with the college search process. Okay. 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 And so now once we've gone past, you know, demographic family information, um, we get to the education and this is where it gets into the more nitty gritty parts of schooling, grades, transcripts, all of that. Um, so we see that he goes to Meadow High School. It's in California, um, Glen Allen, California. Um, and you get the counselor information. You also get GPA. So he's at a 3.3 GPA. If you remember from the Jefferson profile, their average GPA was 3.6. So Jefferson um, University might be a bit of a reach for Kev based off of just that looking at that GPA alone. Um, you also will see his senior year classes. So he is enrolled in some really solid rigor. He's taking AP Calculus, AP World History. I see an honors English class um, and physics as well. So definitely not shying away from rigor in your senior year, which is great. Um, this is kind of a side note from us talking about Kev's application, but I always, always advise students to continue seeking rigorous classes once they get to their senior year. Um, occasionally, you'll see, you know, a student loading up with AP classes junior year and then dropping off all of those in their senior year. Um, but colleges are really looking forward to that consistency and consistently seeking out rigor. So just a quick note there. Um, so he's definitely not shying away from rigor. Um, we'll also see that he's gotten some school awards, some honors award, looks like 11th grade. Um, and then uh, this Jefferson University does ask for test scores. So Kev sent his test scores and he did really great. Um, he got a 670 in the, the evidence-based reading and writing and 710 in math. Um, and I'm going to quickly pull up that profile and you'll see that so he is right in there um, with those middle 50% SAT scores. So he's really hitting their mark for generally average SAT scores that they're seeing. You'll see that he sought out additional SAT subject tests and did very well in those. And so that shows a lot of proficiency and especially you know math, biology and French as well. And he also took some AP subject tests and he got a four on bio, which is a great score. So that's kind of all the test scores we are seeing. Um, and now after that um, kind of brief glimpse into academic profile, we'll get more information on the academic profile in a bit. We get the activities list. And so this is every single thing that Kevin got up to while he was in high school. Um, you can see the first two things he lists are basketball, um, and he says that it's 10 hours a week for 52 weeks um, for that first basketball team, which that is a huge time commitment. Um, that is definitely something college admission counselors look at. So if, for example, a student only lists a couple of clubs, um, I think you can list 10 at the most, but say a student only lists three, but all of those three have a significant amount of hours required, that is definitely something we consider. That is still, you know, being very, very involved in a community. Um, so Kevin, very clearly involved in basketball, 10 hours a week for this team, and he's additionally on another team, um, which I'm assuming is probably a summer team um, or a local club team. Oh, and then I forgot to mention this. You see he lists co-captain and captain. So he has leadership mentorship roles and experience as well. Um, so not only is he spending so much time on this activity, but he is, you know, taken on leadership roles as well. So clearly very, very involved in the basketball community. Um, 
next, we see some more um, supplemental academic experiences. He attended the Georgetown University Summer Institute. Um, I'm going to skip over these real quick because I know there is several other kind of supplemental learning experiences. So he went on a field research trip and he also shares that he's just a science enthusiast. Um, so clearly a student who you know, allows himself to be curious outside the classroom as well and explore his interests um, and really supplement, you know, the classes that he's taking in the high school, or at least that would be my assumption when I was reading his application. You'll see he additionally lists that he's in the jazz bands, um, and that's eight hours a week, which is also a really solid time commitment. Um, so Kevin is really, really busy. Um, and so my, you know, without seeing his transcript yet, my first initial thoughts are, wow, I see that he's taking two AP classes and honor classes senior year, and also, you know, involved in the basketball team. He's a captain, jazz band. Um, so clearly he's involved in a lot um, and he's not afraid to, you know, balance those community involvements with rigorous high school load as well. Um, and that's, qu that's quite impressive. That is very, very impressive. And then lastly, you'll see that he has paid work experience. He went out and got a job, which I think is always like a really great thing to see um, that a student has work experience. Okay, now we're gonna keep on. Okay, so now we've gotten to the personal essay. Um, and this is the actual order in which we see application materials. Um, and I always love to share with students that the personal essay, um, I try to make it sound not as daunting because I find that it's, you know, it's hard to talk about yourself. Um, and I always like to tell students that this is really your chance to put your voice and your personality in your application. Um, and so, you know, make sure that you pick something you're excited to talk about um, when, you know, picking your personal essay or any supplemental essay topics. Um, I'll, before we kind of dive into Kevin's personal essay, share this piece of essay writing advice that I received when I was applying for college colleges, and then it has stuck with me for the past, let's see, six years. Um, and so it was my physics teacher who shared this with me. He said that the goal of any of your college applications should be that if you were to write your college essay, print it out, drop it on the ground, and did not have your name on it. Someone who knows you very, very well should be able to pick up that essay, read it, and go, oh, I know exactly whose essay that is. This is Gabri's essay, or this is so-and-so's essay. Um, and I share that with students in the hopes that telling them that really the main point of that essay is you just have to be yourself. You just have to be genuine. You just have to be yourself. Um, and I know that that sounds cheesy, but I promise you it's true. Um, and I find that that is a really helpful way to relieve some of the stress or anxiety or maybe overthinking about the essay topic. You just have to be yourself. Um, and now that I'm an admission counselor and have read many, many essays, I can promise you that that advice is very, very true and accurate. Okay, now, all that being said, I had to take a quick sip of water. We're going to talk about Kevin's essay um, and kind of why I, this is a spoiler, see it as a pretty successful college essay. Um, I check how we're doing on time. We're doing good on time, so I'm going to read it out loud to make you guys reading it a little easier. Um, so you'll see the prompt is already supplied that he picked. Um, so this is also helpful information. The student does not need to retype the prompt when they are submitting the essay. The prompt that they select will appear automatically. Um, and so he picked to write about the lessons we take from failure can be fundamental to later success. Recount an incident or time when you experienced failure. How did it affect you and what did you learn from the experience? Um, so now that we know what questions his essay should be answering, let's take a look at his essay. So, tiny beads of sweat slowly trickled down my face. My eyes patrolled the terrace, shifting from side to side, revealing my obvious nervousness and confusion. My heartbeat was racing, despite the fact I was feeling fatigued. I was only halfway through my shift and my feet were already sore. What had I gotten myself into? My first day of work is still painfully memorable. At the ripe, ripe age of 17, with the entire summer ahead of me, I decided to apply for a busboy position at the Quail Inn, a five-diamond resort in Sonoma. I still recall the anxiety I felt walking into human resources to fill out an application. Wearing my Brooks Brothers navy blue jacket and slacks, I sat nervously waiting for my scheduled interview. 
Although the questions were simple and straightforward, I found the process slightly nerve wracking and was uncertain about the outcome. Few words can describe the satisfaction and fulfillment I felt when the manager called to offer a position to me. Unlike my previous employment, which was aided by the help of my parents, I got the busboy position on my own. A week later, I arrived to work wearing the requisite orange dress shirt, similar to lobster bisque, a white apron, and black slacks. I underwent rigorous training to learn how to juggle multiple platters, as well as how to navigate the hostess, waiters, and chefs. I still remember my first encounter with the guests, which involved stuttering and butchering the pronunciation of creme brulee. Even more humiliating, I slipped on a wet mat while carrying a tray of bread. Hot sourdough rolls flew into every possible direction. In that moment, it felt like a thousand eyes shot my direction as I sat on the ground embarrassed by what had occurred. In that moment, I realized my skin had contacted the hot pan, effectively resulting in a second degree burn. Man, this is a rough first day of work. Um, as summer progressed, things got better. I became more experienced with clearing tables and pronouncing French desserts. I never burned myself again. However, I did miss a stare and spilled an assortment of half-empty wine glasses and beer bottles on my shirt. Looking back on my first day, I laugh at my mishaps. Life in my little town is pretty sheltered and my parents are naturally protective. Working at the Quail Inn was my first taste of the real world. I learned how to communicate effectively, how to interact with coworkers, and how to work as a part of a team. Most importantly, the events of that first day taught me the importance of not taking myself so seriously and how to best learn from my mistakes. Um, and so, as someone who has read many college essays, I would say this is a really, really strong um, essay. I think one, you get a sense that um, Kevin is clearly very proud that he, you know, went out and sought this opportunity on his own. You see that at the end of that second paragraph where he says, um, you know, unlike my previous employment, which was helped with my parents, I got this on my own. Um, you'll also notice that in the activities list, he listed this position at the bottom of his activities list. Um, and so he had so many other things he possibly could have drawn from for an essay. Um, but this clearly is a really important experience that he has had. Um, and you do get a bit of his personality with the, you know, kind of acknowledging some mess ups that he made, some mistakes that he made. Um, you get some of his you know, description with, you know, requisite orange dress shirt similar to lobster bisque. So you do get a bit of his humor and personality coming through as well. Um, and then lastly, what I think makes this a really, really strong essay is um, Kevin is not afraid from just straight up saying, this is why this experience is important to me and this is how I grew from it. Um, I always tell students, do not be scared of being direct. You can really spell it out for admission counselors. You can say, I decided to write about this because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and you'll see that at the bottom um, where he really says um, all the things that he taught, he learned, or all the things that he learned. He learned to communicate effectively, interact with coworkers, be on a team, um, et cetera. Let's see. Oh, and then we got a question about the essay. How do you trust that he is not coached to write as such? That, that is a great question. Um, so, it is totally fine to like seek out help on how to write the college essay. Um, read, we um, even have a kind of essay writing virtual workshop that we offer pretty regularly. Um, and to kind of like get an idea of like what types of essays are more successful than others. Um, all that being said, it is not okay to have, you know, someone write your essay for you or heavily, heavily edit it to the point that it is not yours. Um, and so this really is, you know, honor code. I'm trusting that the students who are applying to read um, or <laughs> in this scenario applying to Jefferson University um, are writing their essays and they are the ones who wrote it and, you know, no one else did it. Um, but yeah, that is, it's really just an honor code. Um, I always tell students that I, one, reiterate, you know, it's okay to have someone help you, like, look over, review your essay, edit it for minor edits. Not okay to have someone write your essay. Um, and when I say edits, I always recommend um, that uh, it is best to ask only for two people to look over your essay. I often find that if you ask for more than two people, it becomes a too many cooks in the kitchen type of situation. 
Um, I always advise students to ask a trusted teacher to look over the essay for grammatical syntax errors, just to make sure it looks good, it sounds good, it makes sense, um, you know, structurally, organizationally as well. Um, and then I suggest students that they ask a friend or a family member, or someone who you know knows them personally, to read the essay and say, "Yeah, that sounds like you." I find that that is kind of the best method. Um, any more than that, I think, is unnecessary. Okay, and then I got another question in the chat. Um, are the questions on ethnicity, languages spoken at home optional? Um, I, yes, so ethnicity is optional, languages spoken at home. I do believe that um, that might be required. I could be wrong about that. Um, I'm pretty sure most of the demographic questions, it's kind of been up to you on if you provide an answer for that or not. Okay, sweet, we're gonna keep on moving. Feel free to send any other questions that come up. Okay, and this is a really quick, short thing on the application. It's just discipline and school interruption. Um, so any educational interruptions, um, and then also similarly, any disciplinary actions most of the times it's just no, but it is something that we see. So I'm gonna keep on moving. Okay. And so now after, you know, activities list, list essay, we have come to um, the school report. Um, and so a high school college counselor is going to send a school report um, to every single college that their student applies to. Um, and this school report is really, really helpful for us college admission counselors because it tells us just what that school is like. What do they have on offer? Um, a really important policy at Reed is so when we are reviewing applications, we are reviewing an applicant within the context of their school um, because it would be unfair to review applicants who go to two very different schools and compare them. You know, some schools offer APs, some do not offer APs. Um, and you know have different access to resources so this just gives us an idea of what the student has access to at their school um, so quickly we'll see that it's a fairly small high school graduating class of 99 a hundred percent of their graduate um, students who graduate from them go to four-year colleges so that is also very helpful information so this school is this high school is sending every one of their students to a four-year college um, you see the um, ethnic breakdown of the school. You see how many of these um, high school students are first generation students. Um, similarly, are they US citizens? Are they non US citizens? How many are on federal lunch aid? All of that. Um, and then uh, this one curriculum is one of the most helpful parts. Um, so by seeing this, I can see that this school offers 20 AP classes in total. And then you'll see a three is in parentheses right next to it. And so that means this school limits their students to taking only three AP classes per year. Um, and so I know that if a student is taking three AP classes, you know, junior year, three AP classes, senior year, they have pretty much maxed out the amount of AP classes they are able to take. And this class has, on or this school has honors classes as well. Um, so definitely a lot of rigor on offer. If you remember back to, you know, one of those first pages, Kevin reports that he is taking um, two AP classes. So he is definitely seeking out rigor. Now he's not, you know, maxing out that rigor on offer, not taking three, but two, that's still a lot of AP classes. Okay. This is more just school profile information. The second part of the school profile is generally where the high school college counselor can fill out more specifics about that student. Um, so you'll see that um, Kevin's high school counselor enthusiastically recommends Kevin for admission to college. Um, and this high school counselor ranks his curriculum that he has taken throughout high school as very demanding. Um, I think helpful context is the rankings for the curriculum. There is most demanding, 
very demanding, demanding, and then average. I think there's four different options a high school counselor can put there. So he is taking very demanding, which is just one step below most demanding. So seeking rigor and definitely, you know, challenging himself in the classroom. Okay. And now we have Kevin's transcripts. Just from a quick glance, we see A, B students. Um, I would say there's a slight upward trend from mostly Bs in ninth and 10th to some more A's in 11th and as well in that trimester one of 12th grade. One to the letter. I think it's also really important to, to note. So ninth grade, I don't see any honors classes, but in 10th grade, I see three. Um, and then between 10th and 11th grade, he moves from honors classes to AP classes, and then he continues that similar level of rigor in 12th as well. So over the course of his you know, experience in high school, he has slowly increased more and more rigor with his, each year. So clearly he's seeking challenges in the classroom um, and consistently you know, getting AP grades. He's doing really well. You'll also note that um, before I move on, so he's taking English and I believe social studies all four years, same with math and science as well. So he's, you know, sticking with those core classes. This is just a continuation of um, the school profile. Um, let me scroll back real quick. So this part of the school profile is provided by the common application. Um, and then this part of the school profile is a more personalized school profile that Meadow High School made and decided to upload. And then so this just provides even more detailed overview of um, this high school, their you know, graduation requirements, a profile of their class of 2017, so average GPA, all of that, um, and also any um, merits and honors that their students might have received, as long with, um, you know, how their students are doing on the SAT and ACT. So you'll see right here um, for those SAT scores that Kevin, if you remember, um, is actually performing above what is average for his school's SAT performance. Um, so that's also of note as well, I would say. And this is just a list of the classes and then also a list of the colleges that um, this high school stems their students to. Pause real quick because I see we've gotten some more questions. Okay. Okay, does a college apply some kind of normalization to account for the level of difficulty or level of rigor slash competition between two very distinct high schools? Um, that's a great question. Yeah, like I said before, it's really within the context of that school. Um, and so if, you know, a school has tons and tons of AP classes on offer, I'm going to be, you know, viewing rigor as a student, you know, seeking out those AP classes and seeking out AP classes in core subjects. Um, and so I that being said, there isn't a kind of average number of SAT or not SAT, AP classes that I'm hoping to see any given student has taken. It is really dependent on the context of that school, um, especially with, um, you know, a lot of high schools don't have AP. They have their kind of own type of honors um, system. And so it is really, really hard to have this kind of like average of like, okay, this is my like, yes for a, how many AP classes any given student should have taken, if that makes sense. Feel free to follow that up if I did not fully answer your question. We got some more questions in the chat. Um, so Stephen asked, if I attended a small high school for three years and then transferred to a much, much larger school like Mountain View, um, in my case, my old school is closing, so I'm somewhat forced to, that offers much more of P's and other academic opportunities. Will my transcript be seen as weak and are admission officers able to see the whole transfer of schools? Um, sorry for the long question. No worries. Don't, no need to apologize. Um, yes, so we will see that you have transferred schools um, on your transcript. Um, the classes that you took at your prior school will be listed under that school's name and then your semester or year 
at Mountain View will then be listed under Mountain View. So we will know that you changed classes. Um, we will, or not changed classes, changed high schools, and we will know not to expect you to have, you know, checked off or I guess like taken as many of the AP classes on offer at Mountain View because you were only there for one year. Um, so yes, that is something we're definitely informed of. Okay, I see some more questions. Um, so all things from ninth grade to 12th matter, nothing before that is included. Um, yes, correct. Um, so we don't see grades from middle school or anything like that. We just see the grades from high school. Um, yeah, no middle school grades. Let's see. Do people who take fewer AP classes for their mental health have a disadvantage in college admissions? That's a really great question. Um, let's see. So I um, no, I don't think necessarily so. I think that as long as like really what selective colleges are looking for is that a student is one seeking out some rigor and then also doing well in that rigor, um, because that is over a like over the board or across the board, um, the best indicator for college readiness and college success, um, better than SAT scores, AP test scores, all of that. It's just, did a student seek out rigor and then do well? And that is the best indicator for how well they'll do in college. So it is something selective colleges look out for, um, but it is definitely not going to be, you know, the be all end all of an application. I um, always, always, always tell families that the additional information section in an application is your friend. Um, so if you have extenuating circumstances that you want to explain, feel free to provide a write-up of that. And it just provides really helpful context to a college admission counselor who's reading through that application. Um, so if a student did like suffer from mental health or if there was like an extenuating family circumstance, you know, ex for example, um, it's definitely really helpful to note that and kind of explain maybe if there was, you know, a dip in grades because of X, Y, and Z, or maybe a student wasn't able to take this many AP classes because of X, Y, and Z. Okay, let's see. We've got another question. From an admission perspective, is it better for a student to get an A in standard classes or a lower grade in AP honors classes? This is a great question. Um, yeah, so um, <laughs> the joking response that I hear most admission counselors say, it is best to get an A in an AP class, um, but that does not answer your question. Um, so I think that, um, I would honestly say like seek out challenge, you, you know, and if you don't necessarily do, you know, an A in that challenging class, that's okay. Um, because, you know, it still shows that like you like, you know, try to challenge it yourself. Um, I do think that with selective colleges, if a student is not taking any AP or honors classes, it does, um, you know, in this college is rigorous, it does get a little worrying of like, okay, is the student going to have an okay transition to college? Are they going to be successful? Um, so that's why I always say like, try out an AP or honors class. You do not have to load up on them, but just try them out. Let's see. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer because there's so many like facets of the college application that colleges are um, considering. Um, yeah, okay. We've got more questions. How do you evaluate an applicant that has classes from two different schools, one of which is one to one instruction and the other being a top California public high school? Um, yeah, so it's actually quite um, common for students applying from California to be taking classes at different institutions. Um, that's just kind of something I have noticed. And so yeah, we will just receive transcripts from both of the places that they are taking classes from um, and be able to evaluate it that way. Um, we'll also generally receive information about those two different um, institutions that a student is taking classes at. Um, and like I said before, you know, that additional information section is your friend. If a student wants to say, hey, I like also sought out this class at this other institution because the school that I'm enrolled in does not offer that. Um, that is also just helpful information. Um, so we do really receive information from you know every single institution that a student takes classes and earns credit from. 
Okay, I'm going to pause real quick on questions because I want to make sure we get through the rest of this application um, and then we'll open it up to questions. So we've got letters of recommendation. Um, and then before we dive into letters of recommendation, um, I will say, so most colleges ask for two letters of recommendation. I always advise students to ask for letters of recommendation from teachers of different core subjects. Um, it is really great to see a recommendation letter from a, you know, arts or humanities or social studies teacher, and then a letter of recommendation for a science or math teacher. Um, the reason being is, is because it shows a college what a student is like in a classroom in two very different subject matters. Um, and also, you know, a math classroom often has a very different setup from an English classroom. And so it's a really great way to see how does a student handle these two different classroom contexts. Um, so that's just my like personal piece of advice when it comes to recommendation letters. Additionally, I will say make sure your student asks for recommendation letters in advance. Um, and that last minute, so you give teachers plenty of time because, you know, they're busy, they've got a lot of recommendation letters to ask um, and want to be respectful of their time. Okay, and so Kevin has some recommendation letters. He's got this recommendation letter from his high school college counselor. Um, you'll see something of note is that he worked hard to earn B grades. You see this up at the top, both freshman and sophomore years. But once he got his footing, he was able to shift to A level. Um, and so what that tells me is he maybe had a bit of a rougher adjustment to high school. It took a while to probably figure out his study skills, what works best for him. And then clearly he figured it out and is doing really, really well. Um, the college counselor really reiterates he's seeking rigor, you know, AP biology. Um, and also highlights some additional just involvements that he's involved in. So he's currently working to shadow a veterinarian this summer. He didn't list that in his application, that's totally fine. Um, but it's nice to know that, wow, he's you know seeking out this additional thing as well. In the interest of time, we're just kind of gonna skim over the rest of this recommendation to go to the teacher recommendations. Um, so, We'll see that this letter of recommendation, who is from John Applegate, does it say which class? Looks like his AP bio teacher. Um, so you'll note that um, Kevin is not the type of student who is always raising his hand. You see this in the first paragraph, but you see that when he does raise his hand, his peers pay attention. So clearly he's well respected by his peers. And when he decides to speak up and you know share his thoughts with the class, it is generally something like really important and insightful. Um, you also see in the second paragraph that he is consistent. He's always on time, turning in his assignments on time. Um, so he is a consistent worker in this class. Um, and so that's kind of some really important takeaways of just, you know, what would it be like to be in a classroom with Kevin? So he's, you know, clearly involved in his classroom, but he's, you know, maybe not the student who's always raising his hand and that, that's okay. And it kind of goes on to just summarize his interest in science and also uh, willingness to seek out to new opportunities. Um, and then lastly, we'll see um, so Kevin clearly emailed um, the coach, the basketball coach of this college, um, which definitely shows a lot of like initiative and interest on Kevin's part um, to just express interest. And then we will also see um, that the coach emailed the admission office um, saying that this coach is interested in Kevin and also their star point guard is graduating and they will need a new point guard. And um, so that is also just additional information. Um, and, you know, this college being on the lookout for a new point guard isn't necessarily going to be listed on the college profile, but it is, I guess, something that Jefferson University is has in the back of their mind when they're reading applications or reading applications and looking for um, admissible applicants. So that is um, all the information that is provided in a college application. Um, and 
while we don't have time to have a kind of drawn out conversation of, you know, would you guys admit Kevin? What are my opinions? Um, I'm just going to briefly summarize if I would admit Kevin or not. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can see everyone in the Q&A a bit better. Um, so after reading Kevin's application and looking at Jefferson's um, college profile, I would say that Kevin definitely seems like an admissible student. And if I were a Jefferson University admission counselor, I would be voting to admit Kevin. Um, I think, you know, you see an upward trend in grades from mostly B's to A's. He's increasing rigor. He's challenging himself. I'm clearly a community leader and very heavily involved in his community with various involvements in basketball, you know, um, part-time job, jazz band, all of that. Um, his recommendations are unanimously positive and say that he is, you know, well-respected in the community. He's involved, willing to try new things. Um, and yeah, so those are kind of the reasons why I would be like, Kevin seems like a great fit for Jefferson University um, and why I would, I guess, like reason or back up my yes votes if we are in an official admission committee. Um, and so now that we've kind of gone over, I guess, my kind of thoughts on how I read an application, I want to open it up to even more questions. We've already got several in the chat. Um, and so feel free to send them in and we'll just go through the list. Okay. You're doing great, Gabri. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to our parents. A lot of these questions I was trying to answer, but they're definitely going to want to hear from you. So um, thank you so much for your help tonight. Yeah. No problem. Also nice to see you. <laughs> um, okay. Let's see. So Roger asked, do you tend to value the grade or AP, for example, how do you compare an A for a non-AP versus B for an AP course? Um, yeah, so I kind of spoke to this earlier, um, and it, it's, it's kind of a, it's a really tough question um, because colleges, frankly, they're they're one looking at rigor, but then they're also looking at just like how well a student is doing. Um, so it's not really cut and dry because both things are being considered and there really isn't this like one easy answer. Um, you know, we're looking at are they seeking rigor and then also just overall, how are they doing in school and all of their other classes. Um, and so we kind of like, for lack of a better um, answer, really are, are kind of looking to see both, um, looking for both. Okay. Carol asked, a student with a GPA 4.5 in competitive high school versus a student with a GPA for, oh wait, I lost the question, 4.5 in a non-competitive high school. How will the college view these differently? Um, yeah, so um, non-competitive versus competitive. Um, so we do not compare two different high schools um there are students who go to two different high schools against each other we are looking at the like student within the context of that school and also the student within the context of their school group meaning who else is applying from that high school to our college um and so i you know that is kind of what we're looking at. So we're not going to ever compare two different high schools just because that's a really unfair comparison to make just because different high schools have different access to resources and different funding. Um, and especially, you know, like some high schools are private, some are public. Um, so that is just really not something that we would consider or like think about, I guess. Okay. Next, how do you assess activities like art? Can students submit examples of work or a portfolio? Yes, um, I, I love it when a student asks if they can submit a portfolio. I think it's so fun. Um, there are several ways to do that. You can um, either provide a link on your in your college application. You can also email the individual college and ask for that link to be added um, or that portfolio to be added. Um, yeah, so you are more than welcome, students are more than welcome to submit portfolios if they have them or want them to be included as a supplement to their application. Um, I, I see it essentially as a supplement to the application um, a portfolio. So it's not a required thing. It's just kind of additional information about something that the student is really excited and spends a lot of time doing. 
Um, and then also if they list um, art as an activity, that is definitely a very, very valid activity, um, especially because creating art is generally pretty time consuming. So they should definitely list that if that is like a passion and something that they spend um, time doing. Okay, in the college selection process, is some is there some kind of weightage assigned to high school grades, numbers of APs taken, SAT scores, sports, internships, etc. Um, let's see. Yeah, so for Reed, it's going to be different depending on how different college admission offices evaluate applications. Um, but Reed, we don't do any like numbering system when we read applications. We really have this thorough write up um, of all of the different things that we are seeing in an application and an applicant. Um, and Reed's approach is like we are looking for reasons to say yes. Um, and so it is just so many different kind of things that are being factored in that it's not this kind of cut. And so, sanitize could be. You have sanitized on a move. Yeah. Okay. I see we got about five minutes left, so I might not be able to answer all of these questions, um, but we're going to work to get through them. Okay, so, okay, I see a question about SAT and ACT. Um, it's my perception that kids are therefore loading up early on in 10th grade on APs to boost GPA early on to stand out since there are no tests. How is that viewed by college admission counselors? Um, we'll see. Yeah, um, interesting. Yeah, so a lot of schools, they have changed SAT, ACT policies. Some are test blind, some are test optional. Read is currently test blind. Um, I, um, I see some kids taking AP classes in 10th, but I also see a lot of kids, probably the majority, not taking AP classes in 10th. Um, I think the primary reason being is a lot of high schools don't seem to offer AP classes to 10th graders. Um, and also, um, most, so when Reed is looking at applications, we, you know, we receive the unweighted and weighted GPA, um, and we, we change it to be unweighted, um, just that way we are viewing all applications on a 4.0 scale, um, it makes things easier to kind of evaluate. Um, so, so yeah, so for Reed, that wouldn't really make much of a difference in terms of boosting GPA, just because we tend to evaluate on a 4.0 scale. Let's see. Okay. Got about three minutes we left. So I definitely won't... One more, I bet. Time for one more. One more. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to try to quickly scroll through and see if there's a common question I'm seeing. Um, Let's see. Okay, I'm seeing several about letters of recommendation. Um, so I'm going to answer the question about letters of recommendation. Um, so can recommendations come only from staff at the school? Are recommendations from other institutions outside the school considered? Um, yeah, so we always get a recommendation letter or just some note from the high school college counselor. And then the two other letters of recommendation need to be from teachers. Um, so it can be a teacher at that school or a teacher at a former school or another institution that the student has taken classes from. And um, so they do need to be from teachers. Um, you are allowed to send in an additional yeah, third so supplemental letter of recommendation. Coming. Um, and that can be from a coach, you know, a boss at a part-time job. And um, so that additional Didi? letter of recommendation can, 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 can be a um non-teacher letter of rec okay okay so um <laughs> i want to wrap up and make sure everybody can get to their next session and just take the time to thank you so much for sharing um such valuable insights um there's still a lot of questions um, so feel free to uh, shoot us an email at the high schools. Academic counselors can also help um, and put you in touch as well. And I had a lot of questions on there about the school profile. They should be on the school websites, but um, the counselors can also email those to you as well. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Any, any last thoughts? Um, let's see. 
Um, thank you all for hanging out for this hour. Um, don't be scared to email us or just email admission counselors. We are nice. We are happy to answer questions from parents or students. Um, and I'll also quickly throw in the read email into the chat. Oh, thank you so much. Well, thank, right, you. thank you for coming, everybody. Have a lovely evening.